Jesus in this place. You can do a little bit better than that. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus together. Father, you are good, you are strong, you are mighty, you are holy. Six, six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> we up here a little sooner than we thought, so it's all right. We are here. How y'all doing? Y'all ready to worship? All right. We're going to do a little, very familiar song, uh, How Great Is Our God. We're going to add a little spin to it, though. You ready? Yep. You can put your hands together like this. He's a great big God. One more time. How great. How great. Great God, 
You're a strong God. You're a mighty God. You're a delivering God. You're a way-making God. You're a healing God. There is no God like you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Well, just stick around. You might, we might need you, but just hold on. Well, good evening, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? The psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I certainly want to thank God for the praise team kicking us off. I know I've gone a little bit uh, 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 out of line with the program, but you know, if you write something down, that uh, guarantees that I probably won't read it uh, like I should. But this evening, we want to certainly take this moment to welcome each and every one of you to Philander Smith University's uh, thriving in ministry, uh, pastoral and, and minister's workshop. Amen. We are so delighted that you have registered and that you have come out to be a part of this. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a wonderful program uh, sponsored by our college, Philander Smith University, that is uh, designed to, to strengthen uh, pastors and ministers. Uh, we had a wonderful workshop a few weeks ago. Uh, we hosted it over at Second Baptist, where I'm pastor there, on um, the uh, past, uh, men mental health strategies uh, for, uh, for ministers. And it was such a blessing, such a blessing, and I thank God for it. And, um, and tonight we are going to have another wonderful workshop tonight dealing with a subject that's not dealt with very much uh, in, in many circles, and that is merging churches. And you'll be hearing more from our presenter on, on that subject tonight uh, as we come together. And then, of course, we will be having uh, our, our retreat, a retreat coming up on uh, April, the Saturday, April the 27th at St. Mark Baptist Church, and uh, the, uh, the subject is going to deal with preaching and leadership uh, in a post-pandemic world. And uh, uh, Pastor Philip Porner and the St. Mark Church are going to host uh, that uh, uh, wonderful retreat. I'll be uh, giving the, uh, sharing the first uh, uh, lesson on preaching in a post-pandemic world, and then Dr. Porter will be sharing on leadership in a post-pandemic world. I encourage you to sign up and register for it. It's going to be awesome, and I believe it's going to bless you in a wonderful, wonderful way. Just a few things that I need to mention to you tonight uh, that's very, very important, and that is we need you to please uh, fill out our pre uh, workshop survey. There should be a QR, yes, on the screen. And so please um, um, use your phones and what have you to access, access that and, and fill it out. If you don't have access to uh, uh, getting this QR, we do have some hard copies of it available and uh, we'll make sure that you get that. And then after the workshop is over, we will have a post uh, workshop survey, and there'll be another QR code uh, there on the screens. And so this is very important because it helps us to know how to better serve you. Amen. And uh, to know how effective our, our efforts are. We are so grateful tonight to have in our presence the president, the, the interim president of Philander Smith University, Dr. Cynthia Bond Hobson, who is with us on tonight. And I'm going to ask President Hobson if you would come and just give some greetings from Philander Smith University. The world's very best university. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Ann Bond Hobson, interim president and CEO of Philander Smith University. And I wish I could tell you how happy I am to see you all here tonight. You know, the scriptures tell us to study, study to show ourselves approved. And by your 
being here today, you have simply said, Lord, we hear you and we're willing to do what you have asked us to do. I assure you, your churches are going to be better. Our community is going to be better. We're all going to prosper because you are here to learn and to know and do better. Amen? Amen. So I'm happy to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you will take advantage of all of the sessions that are planned uh, by Dr. Watson and his crew. Um, hold on. To Bishop Arnold <laughs> and, and uh, Reverend Watson and all of you, I'm happy to be here. My mama said, make sure you act like you know where you are. Okay. But I'm happy that you all are here. And do please enjoy the sessions and uh, pray for Philander Smith University. It is a jewel in this community, and we want to make sure that we are an asset, an asset to your community and to Arkansas. So thank you so much for being here. Have a great time and be blessed. Praise God. Come on, let's give President Hobson a, a hand tonight. I want you now to turn your attention to the screens. Praise team, y'all have been so wonderful. You got your children here. If you want to leave, you can. You can. All right. All right. All right. All right. Pay, pay attention to the screen. I think we have a little uh, video promo, if that's ready. of the Second Baptist Church, and I'm working with a thriving and ministry program in association with Philander Smith University. I am so very excited about this program. We have some great workshops that's going to be conducted uh, every semester. This year we will be uh, focusing on strategies for mental health for ministers and merging churches, and we'll also have a retreat dealing with preaching and leadership in a post-COVID world. We are so excited about it, and I know that if you participate, it's going to be a blessing in your life. Greetings. My name is Dr. Earl Graham. I serve the Philander Smith University as Department Chair of Philosophy and Religion and Assistant Professor. I'm also excited to serve um, the Thriving Ministry Program um, and all that it has to offer. Um, if I could talk about Thriving in Ministry, it is a wonderful program powered by the Lilly Foundation um, for local pastors to become equipped, trained, skilled in the area of church leadership um, so that they can be best prepared to serve their churches now that we're on the other side of the pandemic. Um, this cohort is the second cohort that has happened for us. Our previous cohort was completed um, at the end of 2023. Now we're excited to be moving forward with a second cohort um, that are preparing local area pastors for the work. Well, hello there. I am Jeremy Carden. I am the Associate Dean for Religious Life and Campus Culture at Philander Smith University. But I also have the opportunity of serving as the coordinator for the Thriving in Ministry program, where we are equipped in ministry leaders, pastors, teachers to thrive in ministry. And so we have this two-year, eight-course, eight-week program that we call Thriving in Ministry, where you are, at the end of the program, able to receive a certificate in advanced pastoral leadership. And so your courses can, can go all the way from um, ministry creativity all the way to worship planning. And so we are encouraging you to check us out. Look up Thriving in Ministry at Philander Smith University. We hope to see you soon. Amen. Praise God for that. Um, we are also grateful to have Dr. Gregory Hudson uh, from Philander Smith with us today, to, tonight. Going to ask him to come and greet us very quickly and tell us your title because I'll mess it up. Come on, Dr. Hudson. Oh, good evening. Oh, that light, I tell you. Uh, that sun. But it's good, Pastor Watson, for the sun to shine on your face, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Pastor Watson, I do like to follow directions, so I serve as the interim executive vice president and chief, of chief operating officer at Philander Smith University, and as well the vice president for student affairs and enrollment management at the institution. You know, when we were thinking last summer uh, about what can we do with the Thriving in Ministry program, Bishop, we said to ourselves, say, look, our ethos at the ins institution would be uh, going back to his mission, right, uh, in training teachers and preachers. So we wanted uh, to, to do something with this program that would be 
far widespread and reaching uh, to um, our ecclesiastical giants, not only in the city of Little Rock, but uh, outside of the greater Little Rock area. And I will tell you that we didn't have to look far uh, to, for someone to partner with Dr. Graham. We went right in our own backyard and got one of our philandarians in the prolific Dr. Watson. And so we appreciate you all for coming this evening. But one thing I want to do, two things I want to do, is to let you know that we are still in the same place since 1877. So you have members in your congregation, I'm sure, that can benefit from an education, from a world-class education with world-class faculty, with world-class staff, with a world-class interim president, and no doubt about, about it with world-class students, faculty, and staff. So I want to encourage you to encourage your members to move the needle on educational attainment uh, in this area and join us uh, in our PSMI program, your younger folk, uh, you know, can join our traditional programs. We offer all of our programs online now as well for the working class adult. So we want, we, we want to encourage you uh, to um, put the word out that Philander Smith University has been around for 147 years, and I can guarantee you we're going to be around for 147 more. So I want you all to, to know that we're with you uh, in your quest uh, to make sure that we move the needle on education and economic empowerment uh, in our region. And you do that with the great equalizer called the college education, right? Uh, and so at the end of the day, Dr. Watson, that's all I have, but I would encourage uh, you to, before you leave, we want you to scan this QR code. And if you don't know how to scan the QR code, we have some lovely young folk in the back that I can guarantee you're going to know because I struggle myself, all right? So we want you to do our pre-test survey and then our post-test survey such that we can get the data that we need. We want to hear from you. We want your feedback as to how we can make this program better uh, moving into the future. So thank you all so much for coming out this evening, and have a blessed evening. Man, thank you, Dr. Hudson. Now, we don't get to have praise teams very often, so since we got one here tonight, come on back on the stage. And while they're coming up, I want to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is one that I know just a little bit. Uh, we grew, basically grew up together, uh, went to the same high school. I led him to Christ um, in the locker room uh, after basketball practice. He was playing football, and I had the opportunity to lead him to Christ. We have been friends for over, uh, close to, no, over 50 years we've been friends. Yeah, it's been over that, uh, Steve. And um, I had a privilege of, uh, of, of uh, hiring him. When I passed at St. Mark Baptist Church, I hired him as our youth pastor. Worst youth pastor I ever had in the history of all youth pastors. But God was using him, uh, God was using that hire to get him in place for him to become the pastor of St. Mark when I left. And of course, God's done a great work through him at St. Mark. And now God is doing an awesome work in his life uh, here at Grace United, along with Pastor Josh. Amen. And so, I am delighted to have, uh, to come and address us tonight, Bishop Stephen Arnold. Come on, praise team, and bless us, and then your pastor is going to come and bless us some more. Listen, we're not going to be much longer. Um, if we can, let's just get intimate with the Lord. If you can just close your eyes for a second and just begin to thank him and then talk to him the way you talk to him, however and whatever that looks like, just for a brief moment as the music plays.
Yes, we pour it out, say. We pour it out. We pour it out. We pour it out. All of our love. We pour it out. All of our affection. Yes, we pour it we out. give it all away. We pour it out. 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 Yes, we pour it out. We pour it out. We won't withhold from you. We give you all. Put those hands together. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. His breath in our lungs, we pour out our praise. Let everything that hath breath praise the wonderful name of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We give God glory. We are humbled and honored uh, to have the opportunity to share uh, in this amazing ministry that Philander Smith has given birth to. I believe that it is so valuable to sow into leaders, uh, men and women of God that are endeavoring to lead the body of Christ, uh, that we may be as sharp as possible to navigate in these challenging times that we are living in. I've uh, been in ministry for 42 years, and I have never seen uh, the landscape of the kingdom and church like it is today and we need something just like this to help each and every one of us navigate in this season would you say amen to that amen amen, amen. give it up for my mentor my friend my big brother dr mo watson amen thank you for the introduction uh t tonight we uh we're dealing with understanding mergers I like to refer to it as marriages between other churches. Uh, merger is somewhat of a legal term, uh, but marriage is more in line with what I believe God wants to happen when two churches become one. I know you may be wondering in your mind, those who may not be familiar with what's going on here at Grace United, how did this get started? Well, I can't tell you how this got started by myself. If y'all don't mind, my co-laborer, give it up for PJ, Pastor Josh. In the midst of the pandemic, we had left our previous location over in the east end of Little Rock, and we were looking for a location. I reached out to a mutual friend of ours who at the time was staying right across the street, right across the street. from Josh. And uh, he said, I know of someone. And so he reached out to Josh. And the amazing thing, and this is how we know that when God is in the midst, and, and let me say this right here, this, this merger stuff may not even be for you. But at the end of the day, you need to never close your eyes to the move of God. Absolutely. Right. Amen. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Because whatever we're doing, it's a God thing yeah. when it comes to doing what God has called us to do as spiritual leaders. And uh, fast forward, we got together, we talked. And so, but all of this started with a prayer. Everybody say prayer. Prayer. And this young man uttered a prayer in his private prayer closet. And look at what God has done. Josh. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I grew up in Memphis, um, public school system in Memphis, and uh, probably a lot, like a lot like you, I remember walking down the street as a child and I would say, I would say it now, you could cut the racial tension with a knife sometimes. You know, when I was passing somebody in the street that had a different color skin than me, like I could feel it in Memphis. Grow up, God calls me into the pastorate. Uh, and then fast forward to, I was given the pastor to this church 10 years ago. It was a burning dumpster fire, <laughs> burning dumpster fire of a church. First two years, I just kind of get it together. And then God says to me, 
you need to move this from just an all white church, white, white, white church. And I need you to change this into something that's gonna scream the glory of God to the city. So we attempted to do several things. We attempted to do several things that did not work. <laughs> it just, it just, it's just, it didn't work. And so, uh, so I was saying, Lord, you have told me to do something. And what I'm trying to do is not working. So I'm kind of at the end of my rope. And as you guys know, when you get to the end of the rope, that's when God can start moving the best. You follow Amen. me? Amen. So I got to, and so what the Lord told me to do, it, this is just part of the story. It's part of the Lord. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray that an African-American church would move into your building and share it with you. And once you pray that that happens, what I will do is, is build something that you have, you've never seen before. But here's the kicker. The Lord told me, he said, I want you to pray this prayer, but you can't tell anyone. He said, you can't tell your deacons, you can't tell your elders, you can't tell your wife. Didn't even tell my wife. He said, just pray this prayer and see me move, right? And so I pray the prayer and I pray the prayer. And I pray, y'all prayed prayers like this and I pray the prayer, right? And you're kind of like, well, Lord, you, you told me to pray this prayer and then, you know, and then uh, I get the phone call from Brock. They, I, I, it, the Lord's hands just all over this. He's, he's across the street. I go over to help him. He's moving out. I go over to help. I saw him. He needed to move. He was trying to move something by himself that was way too big for him to move by himself, right? So I'm like, let me go help you. And at that moment, ring, ring, Bishop Arnold calls, right? I had never heard of Bishop Arnold in my entire life. <laughs> he's like, how do you not know Bishop Arnold? I was like, I knew the rock, right? Uh, and so Bishop Arnold came in. I know, it's funny. It should be funny. Um, Bishop Arnold, and we sat right back there. Ron, raise your hand for me. Where Ron's sitting. We sat right back there with Bishop and uh, three of his partners. Uh, Al Romes was back there with us. And... Um, we were just talking about, they were just looking for a place to be, right? That they were just looking for a place to be. And, uh, and it was at the end of the first time, because I had been keeping this secret for a long time. So I was just ready to tell the secret, right? And so and I'm just kind of a straight shooter. And so Bishop and, and Al and all, all of us were sitting back there and I said, hey, uh, I know you're looking to rinse. And listen, I just don't want to freak you out, but I know why you're here. I know why you're here, right? And he'll tell theirs, but as they, you know, went to their cars, they're like, that crazy white boy is, right? Right? I mean, that's just how the conversation. That's basically what I see. That's just how the conversation <laughs> went. But that's how, how else is the conversation going to go? Uh, but it was all birth because the Lord, sometimes the Lord wants to do something so amazing that he's just going, he's not only going to flabbergast you, he's going to flabbergast the city, anyone who's watching, but he's going to make sure that he's not going to share the glory with anybody. Amen. Right? And so he's say, I'm going to do something in the city of Little Rock and I'm going to do it. You're not going to have anything to do with it. I'm going to do it and I'm going to get the glory and Jesus' name is going to be praised because of what's happening. Yeah. Amen. 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 Hold up, hold up. Don't wait. Don't, don't leave yet. That, that, that was the beginning. That was the beginning stage. We moved in, and he had already shared why we were here. And I'm like, well, pump your brakes. Pump your brakes. It's, it's kind of like when you first go out on a date, and the person say, I'm ready to marry you. And I said, oh, no. And so my suggestion was, I tell you what, let us start every fifth Sunday coming together as one church right. and have one service. Everybody say dating. Dating. Okay. So it started with a prayer, and then we went from moving in to dating for a whole year. Mm -hmm. And it was during that dating period that we got acquainted. Right. That we start communicating. That we start doing things together. I said all of that to say that if you're praying about a merger, it's not something that can happen overnight. Oh, no. We had a good long runway, and even with the runway, mm -hmm. God accelerated the pace. Mm -hmm. 
what we thought was going to take two or three years, God did it in one year. How's things because, going? It is because our people accelerate, right, accelerated. Like we, we, we said, and we're like, you know, we're going to do this this month, and well, about six months and about a year. And our both sides were like, we're tired of not being together. We're tired of only doing. So we went from fifth Sundays to every fourth Sunday, and it, they they were just like when are y'all going to make this happen? And so that's what accelerated it yeah. is our people were like, let's see the Lord work now. Right. Yes. And how are things going? Um, we are, we have a growth problem. <laughs> we, um, I, I would be shocked. I, I'm just being honest. I would, I would be shocked if we're not the fastest growing church in the city. Um, we have my guess and this, you're better with numbers than I am, but my guess is that when we first started our average attendance on Sunday morning was 325, uh, Easter, of course, we had 1100 in the house with another thousand online. Um, but you know, our average attendance has probably doubled, uh, in about 18 months. So we're probably, you know, we're clipping over 600 on the regular with no signs of slowing down because when, the, when people look at this, I, and I've said this about, so for example, I'll give you an example. When you work with orphans, when you work with widows, right? I always say that that ministry sells itself. You don't have to tell people, oh, I, you know, you don't have to hype people up to get behind that. When people walk in these doors and they see what's going on, you don't have to convince anybody to come back to church. You don't have to convince anybody that the Lord's in the house. They see it and they're like, I'm in. Amen. So that's, that's how I think it's going. Amen. Give it up for Josh. So I, I wanted him to come and to share his heart because if it had not been for his prayer, we would not be doing what we're doing right now. So can y'all show him some love one more time? Amen. All right. Y'all ready for this? All right. Church mergers uh, may be called many names, but the core idea is that two or more churches becoming one by combining integrating, unifying people, structures, systems, resources to achieve a common purpose, to do life and ministry together as a vibrant, healthy expression of Christ's body. Is there a merger possibly in your future? There are some questions that you need to really be real with within yourself. Would, you know, where is your church now? Is it strong? stable, stuck, struggling? Is your church stable, stuck, or struggling, dissatisfied with your status? Is your church growing and in need of more space? Could your church mission be accomplished better through a merger with another church? Is your church without a pastor or having difficulty finding one? Have your church been approached by another church to even think about a merger? There are some questions that we have to at some point really get real with. And there are four main things that I want to present to us tonight that I hope as leaders, and maybe you're not even a pastor, but you are part of a church family, that you really need to look at these things as you approach unifying, merging a ministry. Now, the first thing that has to happen is ego. Everybody say ego. ego. Now, <laughs> if you're talking about merging with another church, everyone has to put their egos aside. Sacrifices will have to be made by everyone. All right? Uh, when we started this, uh, this merger, Everyone had the same thing. They had a pastor. Grace Temple had a pastor. They had leaders. We had leaders. They had a music ministry. We had a music ministry. And, and so everyone had to come together. Sacrifices had to be made. Well, let me put it this way. It's like when you get married. <laughs> come on, somebody. And, and, and if you're going to stay married— <laughs> 
sacrifices, come on somebody, <laughs> will have to be made because both parties bring tradition and history to the table. And, and, and show me a couple that one person gets everything that they want, that other person is probably pretty miser miserable. Amen? There has to be sacrifices made. And when we're talking about coming together and merging multiple churches, sacrifices has to be made. You must go into a church merger with a team mindset. Everybody say team. Team. You have to have a team mindset and be willing to make sacrifices for the well-being of the team. Can we be real up in here? Because we had two worship leaders. At some point, we had to make a decision about one worship leader. But we didn't do that overnight. It took a lot of prayer. It took a lot of meditation. It took a lot of time to get to that point. Because what we're doing here at Grace United, please hear me when I say that, it's bigger than all of us. Come on, somebody. You see, th this is not just something we decided to do. I look at this as a kingdom of God move. You see, it, mo most people who know me, and, 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 and Dr. Watson gives me a hard time about this, I'm Church of God in Christ. <laughs> but I had to come to a place of realizing, and hear me when I say this, it's more important for me to be kingdom than Kojic. It's more important for me to be kingdom than Kojic. And Lord knows I love Kojic, but I love the kingdom more. Because God is not coming back after Kojic. He's coming back after his church. Are y'all with me in the house? And at some point, we've got to be more mindful of the kingdom than our denominations and some other things that we hold so near and dear. Amen? So it's about team concept. In this day and time, a team is better than a one-person superstar. Somebody say, I need a team. I tried to do this by myself. And in this season of my life, this is the most peace, joy, yes, sir. workload I done ever had. Yeah. Everything is not on me. Right. Why? Because we have a team. team. Right. You've already met my other co-pastor, Pastor Josh, my executive pastor, would you please stand? Roderick Rogers. Uh, our finance guy, Paul K. Tron, would you please stand? I'm glad and I'm grateful that we have a team. We're not in this thing by ourselves. Ego is all about our flesh. Come on, let's be real. Ego is really easing God out. <laughs> yeah. We, we ease God out of many situations because it's about us, Amen. what we want, how we want to do it, instead of consulting God. Amen. And when you go into a church merger, there will have to be sacrifices made. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Our egos will get in the way of the will of God. Y'all agree with that? Yes. Yeah. We, we have to put our egos aside. Amen? Now, here's, here's number two, economics. Everybody say economics. Yeah. Now, go, going into this right here, in many cases, it will benefit all parties financially to come together. It breaks my heart when I drive around this city, North Little Rock, and I see so many struggling churches. It breaks my heart when I get phone calls from pastors' wives that are saying that her husband is taking money out of their house to keep a church going. They can't go on vacations. 
because the husband, because of ego, because he don't want to close the doors. He don't want to merge with someone else because he may lose some clout. <laughs> Come on, y'all. But economically, they're struggling. Rob and Peter, they'll do what? And Paul don't even get paid. <laughs> Are y'all with me? When I look at what we did here, not only did we have to put egos aside, but it helped both churches economically. Are y'all with me? It was an economic boost to both churches. A lot of churches are going through financial hardship right now. Some church leaders are making unnecessary sacrifices to trying to keep churches afloat. Get this right here. Two are better than one. Amen. Yeah. In Acts chapter 16, verses six, uh, 9 and 6, uh, 9 and 10, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and, and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. <laughs> yeah. And, and get this right here. There comes a time you got to ask for help. Yeah. And I believe if we seek the face of God, God's got a lot of ways of helping us. Amen? Amen. So the first thing is ego. The, the, the second thing is equality. Okay? In most cases, each party will bring something to the table of value that can be used in a merger or a marriage. Yes, One of the churches may have a building, and the other churches may have many, uh, members. That's what happened here. Can we be real? We needed a, a facility. Okay? I was over in East Little Rock. They was getting ready in the midst of the pandemic to change our note from 10000 to 13000 And I can't have church on the inside. The devil is alive. I said, I tell you what, I give y'all the keys back. And lo and behold, I made a phone call, and bam, here we are. This building is paid for. Somebody say it's paid for. And so, in the midst of all of that, this was something that God orchestrated. Amen. And I didn't need to let my ego <laughs> interfere with the hand of God. Amen? Amen? Now, get this right here. One church may have strong administration, and the other church may be strong in outreach. Like in any relationship, when two or more come together, it is very important that we try to utilize each other's strengths. Amen? What we've had to do, because we've had to adapt and just on the move. We've had to get things in place while we're still growing and moving all at the same time. And just now, we're starting to realize each other's gifts and weaknesses. And so, one of the things that we've done over the last couple of months is to really start fitting into where a person's gifts are. Where my gift is, where Josh's gift is, where Roderick's gift is. And, and right now, I'm a visionary. Josh is about getting the direction going a certain way. He's the executor. <laughs> He's going to execute the vision. I'm going to share it. He's going to write it. He's going to run the play. That's our gift set. I don't need to be writing it. He don't need to be telling it. I don't need to be executing it. I don't need to be the youth pastor. 
<laughs> At all. <laughs> it is always a great idea to prayerfully, a great idea to prayerfully set down and do a gifts assessment of leaders and their churches. Because if you don't, you'll end up bumping heads with each other. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You know, it, it's like a marriage. You know, now don't, don't tell my wife this. Don't, please don't tell her. Don't tell her. But my wife is not good with managing money. <laughs> That's my job. Are y'all with me? I, don't, I know you. You're going to be the first one to say something. <laughs> but, but everyone has their weaknesses and their strengths. She's an organizer. She going to organize the house. I'm not good at that. She got that. Everyone has their weaknesses and their strengths. But sometimes we let our ego get in the way, and we're trying to do something that we're not even gifted to do. And we make the ministry, even a marriage, messed up because we're operating outside of our anointing. Can I get Pentecostal for a little while? <laughs> and the worst thing to ever do is to operate outside of your anointing. Amen? If you got some oil on you in a certain area, let the oil flow over there. If you don't have it over here, leave that area alone. Amen? Grace, uh, we, we refer to now Grace Temple Legacy, Grace Church Legacy. Grace Church uh, Legacy was big on foreign mission. Grace Temple was big on local mission. We've had to marry those two things together, not eliminating one or the other, but doing it together, foreign as well as local. Are y'all with me in the house? So, and, and get this right here. Let, let's go a little further, and, and let's be real. Uh, I'm 60, almost 64. I'll turn 64 before you. Uh, so, um, I, I'm in this season of my life that, that I can say what I want to say. I used to have a problem with the black flight that was going on in the black church. Blacks moving, going out to predominantly white churches, they would leave a black church as a chairman and go work on the parking lot. Uh, at a white church. And if we would have asked them to work on the parking lot, they'd have been offended. Yeah. Well, when we did this right here, we came to the table, and it was about equality across the board. Yeah. We're an elder-led ministry. Yeah. At this time, we have six elders, yeah. three black, three white. Yeah. Are y'all good with that? Yeah. In other words, there's fair representation. Yeah. Amen? Not, not only as it relates to the membership, but leadership. Yeah. Amen? So that's what it's all about. Then here's the last thing, eternity. Everybody say eternity. eternity. It will make an eternal impact on the kingdom of God by demonstrating unity, love, and grace to an outside world. What God has put together— at Grace Temple Legacy and Grace Church Legacy yeah. is making and sending a message to the body of Christ and to the world outside. Yeah. Let's be real. The church in these last probably 15 years, we've lost a lot of credibility yes, because how we have conducted ourselves as leaders as well as church people. Some kind of way we've got to restore credibility. And I'm glad and I'm grateful, as Josh said, we don't have to sell what we're doing here. It's a visible demonstration of what Jesus prayed for that we might be one. Here in Little Rock, Arkansas, home of the Little Rock Nine, you've got two churches a predominantly black and a predominantly white church coming together to be one church. Amen? That sends a major message of love because some kind of way we got to stop fussing and fighting with each other. Amen? 
and at some point we've got to learn how to get alone. Rodney King said a long time ago, can't we all just do what? Get along. Amen? And Lord have mercy, if we can't get along at 11 o'clock for an hour and a half, what's wrong with us? Don't we supposed to have the love of Jesus Christ on the inside that we can not only love each other, but we can love black, white, red, whatever? Are y'all with me in the house? So it sends a message. It makes an eternal message to the outside world. The kingdom of God is further extended by us coming together as a church. Okay, now. Can't we get this right here? Uh, don't move forward with the merger mm -hmm. if you don't see God's fingerprints all over it. Yeah. Okay? We've blessed, we've been blessed here, and, and I'm humbled and I'm honored, I'm grateful for the hand of God. But don't rush out <laughs> and just say we finna merge with somebody. You've got to see the Lord's fingerprints all over it. But if there's an overwhelming sense that God has brought this merger together, enjoy the ride. Get this right here. Some other things to keep in mind. What are the possible legal issues? One church merging into another. You got taxes, all of that. Right now, we're still finalizing some of the legal things yeah. here. Closing down accounts, shifting, because once we do that, we'll dissolve Grace Temple, Grace Church, and we'll start Grace United. Yeah. That's the legal part. Yeah. And if you don't know how to do all of that, that's when you consult an attorney to come to the table to help you with the process, okay? This time I want to open it up for questions. Yes, sir. So have the two churches join? Have the two churches, yes. So at what point are we going to really help you with the microphone so that the people online can hear the Yes. So at what point do the two churches join? We've already joined. Right now, it's just the finalization of those details. We're already one church. I have a question. Yes. So, Pastor Arnold, mm -hmm. um, good stuff. But how do, if, if two churches are going to merge, then somebody ain't going to be the pastor anymore. Right. How do you decide that? <laughs> you, you want me to take that one? Um, I think uh, for, you know, I, I, I think that if, for example, uh, we were in a different scenario. Let's just say if it was a white church and a white church, or African American church and African American church, right? You would probably, more than likely, you would say this person is the natural person to do that, and you would give them that title. In what we're doing, it is so important for you and me, in in this sense, to be equals, right? Because if 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 when we merged, we said, you know what, Josh is going to be the pastor, and this would never happen in a million years, right? So let's just laugh about it. But Josh is going to be the pastor, ambitious, the associate, African American people are gone, you know, because they're like, well, you know, and the same with me. It, it was important for me and you, you know, working in our gifting, you know, slotting into our roles, using that, but you and I had to be at this level equals for this to work and continue to work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's how it worked here. I don't think that's how it has to work at, in every scenario, but in, I would say at a church, if they're trying to do what we're doing, you have to have that co-pastorate. But again, like you said, we've learned to slip into our gifting, 
you know, as co-pastors. And so you and I don't do the same. I mean, you know, we 50, 50 for each, but we don't do the same things outside of that because I need you to do what you're doing and you need me to do what I'm doing It's for this thing to grow. Y'all get that? Amen. Yeah. And once again, even in the co-pastor, we have very defined roles. Okay. Very defined roles. I'm the visionary pastor. He's a directional pastor. Then we have an executive pastor. And there has to be maturity between the two of us for that to work. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you, you said it, but I would say that if you do something, if you're looking to do something like this, I mean, right, like pray is here, <laughs> humility is here, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, you and I have had to have a hundred conversations, 200 conversations where we say, when you said that, what did you mean? Or you hurt my feelings or, you know, like you, we've talked before, like yeah, we, yeah, we all use the same, like, like when y'all say deacon and we say deacon, we mean two different things, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? And he, he came in, he came in saying, he came in saying, my dad, he, when you talk about Bishop Lindsay, uh, my dad, I was like, Bishop Lindsay's your dad? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, no, that's not, you know, it's, we just speak different languages, right? I know, right? It's funny, right? Um, I'm the comedy guy around here. And so it's, it's, uh, I, but I think for us, yeah, that, that was crucially important. Yeah. Next question. Bishop uh, and Pastor, um, was there or was there a need for buy-in for the congregations? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> how did that, what how what did we that? did, uh, Grace Temple Legacy, on a monthly basis, uh, during that time, we was just coming out of pandemic, and we would have basically monthly meetings on Zoom. Sometimes we would have as many as 100 people on a Zoom call because my people had what? Questions. <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had questions. And I had to answer those questions to reassure them the direction that we were going. I, I could not stop communicating with them. They needed to know the process from day one mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, once again, we're coming from two different cultures. Mm -hmm. In the African-American community, and most of y'all may not want to be real with this right here, but uh, women, especially the mothers, hold a lot of influence in the black church. Right. I'm well aware of that. <laughs> Amen? So Mother Hill, Mother Nettie, they, I had to, before I even talked to my deacons, <laughs> I had to get approval from them. And that's just wisdom, okay? Uh, as a leader, we, we can never be blind to the people we need to be on board because if you think you're a leader and you're leading somebody and nobody's following you, you're just taking a walk. You're just taking a walk. Amen? Okay. Yeah. And I, Good and I question. Think, I think part of that for, um, for me, two things that are helpful is uh, I viewed it as, uh, uh, first off, God changed my mind. And then... I had to work down to my elder level because we were an elder led church and had to get the, their minds changed, which it was just, uh, I'd love to tell you this story. One of our, just one of our elders who was probably the one that held on to, and he didn't know it because a lot of times you hold on to racism, you don't even know it till it kind of comes out. Right. So he would say that. And he, a year after this started, he went from the one that's like, I don't know, we can do this. I don't know, we can do this to a, a seminal moment in our, in our, we had an elder meeting and he was weeping. And he said, look, if God wants us to give them just a $5 million building and walk away, we're going to give them a $5 million building because that's what the Lord wants to do. And we're like, we've made it, right? So, you know, I think that's part. And, and I think the other thing is, especially with things like this, I think the analogy of uh, our, the illustration of moving the pulpit really, really helps. I don't know if you heard this. If you have, forgive me. Um, the story goes like this. Uh, church, church doesn't have a pastor. They hire a pastor. The pastor comes in and the pulpit is on the right side of the stage. Yeah. Have you heard this one before? Okay. If you have, just forgive me. So the pulpit is on the right side of the stage and he walks in and he says, the pulpit should obviously be on the left side of the stage. It needs to be on the, it should be on the left side of the stage. So he picks up the pulpit. He puts it on the left side of the stage. A week later, he gets fired because at that church, the pulpit goes on the right side of the stage. That's what his members believe. Right. 
So he goes away. Three years later, he comes back and visits that church that fired him, walks in the door, and lo and behold, the pulpit's on the left side of this, it's on the other side of the stage. And so after the service dies down, he goes up to the pastor and he says, Pastor, listen, I came here and the pulpit was on the right side of the stage and it should have been on the left side of the stage. And I said, we're going to move to the left side of the stage. And I moved it and they fired me by coming here and it's on the left side of the stage and you're still there. How do you do it? He goes, you know what I did? I moved it an inch at a time. So I moved it here and I moved it here and I moved it here. And eventually it's just on the left side of the stage. And as people say, of course it should be on the left side of the stage. So a lot of times in things like this, especially if it's seminal, there's, you know, this is your church and this is your building. This is your elders. And there's that ego, right? And we, we say your ego is not your amigo, right? But a lot of things is if you're a good leader, you can have a vision and understand, I'm going to have to take my people an inch at a time an inch at a time. And if I can take them an inch at a time, we'll eventually get to the promised land. And I have time to wait. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. As I hear you all, uh, Bishop, Pastor, uh, the merger, the marriage. Mm -hmm. In marriages, when families come together to have children, sometimes the children, like Josh's children, will try to bring you to get Josh to do something they've been trying to get him to do for so long. Am I, am I making sense? Do you all have that issue where your people have clinged to Josh to get you to do something they've been trying to get you to do or vice no, versa? No, we hadn't had that. You had that? No. Uh -uh. Okay. I, no. I was just wondering. You yeah. know how it Good question. Where they'll try to lean mm -hmm. towards one right. to try to, you know, those right. type of things. Right. Well, if, if anything, I would just say that uh, it, it's more along the lines of when you have that blended marriage, your children will talk about the other one, right. you know, and they'll talk about, and so, you know, a lot of what Bishop and I have to do is to, is to slowly and patiently say, you know what, I hear that, but let me speak truth into that, or I hear that, but, you know, I don't even understand that about Josh, so let, let me go ask those questions, and so, you know, as your parent, you take the children, and you say, we're doing this, but let me explain it to you, and so I think there's more of that than the other way around. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, uh, speaking to that question, uh, we had a uh, new member orientation, well, new member uh, luncheon, and uh, some of the people uh, that were accustomed to how I did things, how I dressed. Mm -hmm. Now, he put on some shoes uh, tonight, but, <laughs> but, they're, but, they're, but they're new. I wanted to show them off. <laughs> <laughs> but that's normally not his normal footwear. Normally, he got on flip flops. And, and some people voice that. Yeah. You know, so sometimes it takes people a runway, yeah. a longer time to get adapted to a certain style. Yeah. But the good news is people have been very patient and they've made some adjustments. Yeah. Who's next? Yes, sir. Bishop Pastor. The question is, I pass it down in, in the Delta, a lot of small churches, some have two, three members. And my question is, how do you... Um, go to them and try to explain to them maybe we all just need to come together because it, there are several churches they members will come and visit but they won't join because they say that's my home church down there. I can't leave <laughs> mm -hmm. but there's nobody there but two or three of them yeah um, I brought him up for a reason because it started with a prayer and, and that's my encouragement to anyone when God gives you a burden, when God gives you a vision, it starts with a prayer. Uh, that prayer is a seed. And we've got to trust God to bring that seed to a harvest. Uh, it starts with a prayer. And then someone has to be a forerunner. Right. Someone has to blaze the trail uh, for this to happen. Right. Sometimes people have to see someone else do something before they ever get the courage or vision to do it. Right. Yeah. The other thing that I think I would say to that is um, a good illustration would be um, bottom line, knowing your, why, why th those people would have to have a, a, a word is vision, but you would have to give them a, you have to give them a big enough vision that overcomes what they know you know, what they've been doing. Um, because if you can, uh, a good illustration is losing weight, right? Most, most Americans want to lose weight. Most Americans know that they should lose weight, right? It's just, it's just, in, it's just America. But most Americans, why do we do it? Because the why is not burning deep inside of them to get to 
that other side of wherever that happens to be. Does that make sense? And so I would say that those people have to have a compelling vision and a compelling why to move from their seats to make something bigger happen. Anyone else? In the African African American church, we saw or see the early service is a more traditional service. Then we have a contemporary service. And with the cultural differences, can you briefly explain how you merged uh, the the, the African-American church with the predominantly white church, particularly the preaching schedules and differences? You want to take that? Sure, I'll take that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I love it when he's like, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I'll, I'll go in the reverse order. Um, the, one of the things that, that we tried to do that, and I think that we've done rather successfully is, is here's the reality. The African-American church is really good at some things. Like y'all got it going on in some area. Like, let's just talk about worship. Like our worship, real boring. I'm just saying it is. It's just real, I'm, I'm real bored by it. It's real boring, right? It's just, it's just, you know, it's like just, it's just the way it is, right? That's why and, I want you to take that. Thank you, right? No, I'll, I'll, I didn't want to say it. I know, that's okay. <laughs> Hey, when when you said the Rodney King joke earlier, I leaned over Ron and said, I couldn't make that joke. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You shouldn't have me up here. Anyway, uh, (laughs) right. And so, uh, but the reality, and there's some things that my church was good at, like we're just good at, right? And so what we said is, let's not try to make some weird church that no one recognizes. Some weird gray church in the middle where African-Americans don't recognize it and white people don't recognize it. Why don't we just try to figure out what y'all are great at, what we're great at, put it together, send it out there, and it's awesome. So that's part of it. The preaching schedule is, it kind of goes back to the co-pastor idea in, in, in our thing. The reality is that uh, the good news, I believe, is that we're both really, really good preachers. I, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm not trying to, be, to toot our own horn, but the Lord has gifted both of us in that area. And so, and part of it is we try to get as 50-50 as possible um, because, because of that evenness. Now, what we do do is... Um, People will try, you know, people just naturally will have a favorite. You just do. You just have a favorite. And so we, uh, we mix it up. Sometimes I'll go two weeks in a row. Sometimes it'll go three weeks in a row. You know, we'll, ha- we'll ha- work it out so that people don't know when we're preaching. You know, you'll figure it out when you walk in, you know. Um, so we don't let them pick their favorites. Hey, let, let, me, let, me, let me bring that home. Can I say it? I don't use it. <laughs> Music-wise. Basically, it kind of boils down to we do a lot of white songs with a black flavor. Because Karen told me not to say it. Because I was going to ask the same thing. How, yeah. Because I don't know, Pastor Joseph, you know who Dr. Watts is, right? Mm-hmm. Can you sing a Dr. Watts for no. me? No. You can. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I was going to ask, because I'm in music, uh, mm-hmm. basically, how do you merge? And I think you guys pretty much have answered the question mm-hmm. because we have so many styles of singing and then yeah. how we're do not, you get balanced? We're, we're, we're not a choir church. We are a praise and worship church. Yeah, but a lot mm-hmm. of it, so uh, and it works here, right? But, it, but yeah. even, even in that, for us, what we did is we took uh, what we considered the better elements. Of, so, for example, here's two good examples: um, white churches, if uh, K Love, you know, whatever it is, ninety three point three or ninety six point eight, whatever, whichever it is. Like at a white church, you sing when the when the person singing on stage, how great is our God, right? You sing with them, whereas in the African-American church, it's a call and response, right? So we, we like the call and response more. So our, all of our songs are kind of that call and response thing. At, at African-American churches, generally, you don't have the words on the screen because you have that call and response from, obviously, the history of the African-American church. Whereas, listen, if there are not words on the screen, 
white people are not going to sing. Because that's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes. And so we have call and response. And for our people, they had to learn call and response. We're like, how does this go? So they would sing, like, no, no, you wait till when everybody, you know, right? And, and his people are like, why are the words on the screen? Why do we need words on the screen? We're like, because we got to know, right? So, so those are two brief examples of, of yeah, of that. <laughs> Who's next? Yes. Pastor Jay, how yeah. long have you learned Spanish? It'll be two years come September. Yeah. Okay. Pastor Jay, have you learned how to hoop yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> but, I but, 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 I, but I will say, I will say a lot of times when, and, and you know this in a regular marriage, in a regular marriage, um, uh, two become one, right? And, those, and husbands and wives start to look a lot you know, start saying the same phrases and start buying their stuff at the same stores and have the same gate, right? So I would say that my, my preaching has moved a lot closer to Bishop's preaching. Now I'm still holding on to that and I'm, he doesn't hoop, so I'm not going to hoop, but I, but I have, I think I have got, you know, preaching is an art form. I mean, Dr. Watson, it's, a, and y'all know preaching is an art form. And so if you love the art, you continually get better. And so I believe that I've become a better preacher because I've taken what, what, I, what God has allowed me to take from uh, his style. It just, so for example, I'll give you an example. A, you know, typical white church, uh, preacher starts and the white people say nothing. You, like you don't, you don't, like, and if, if the kids make a, a noise, you are horrified that they made a noise. You're like, oh, it's supposed to be completely silent. Whereas now, like from the get go, I consider my sermons an interactive dialogue the entire time. That wasn't true two years ago, but it's a lot more fun for me, you know? And I, like Bishop does, like when they're not talking about it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna say it again and y'all are gonna respond this time, right? <laughs> uh, so, but, so that's part of it, yeah, yeah. Who's next, anyone else? All right, were you all blessed by this on today? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, we're going to bring up Dr. Watson. Give it up for Dr. Mo Watson. Come on and join me in expressing our thanks and appreciation to Bishop Arnold and Pastor Josh for that wonderful presentation. We certainly hope and pray uh, that uh, you have found this uh, time together uh, helpful and beneficial uh, and maybe even accepted for somebody as a challenge for you to take that risk. Uh, I heard someone say, you know, two or three members and, and somebody has to break the ice. To take that risk, if you will, to uh, talk to someone and, and begin, and, and as Bishop said, it begins uh, with fervent prayer. But you have to take that risk, and I, I hope and pray that <clears throat> as a result of this workshop tonight that somebody will be challenged to do that. Now, um, just a couple of things. Of course, we do need you to fill out your post-workshop uh, survey. Uh, the QR is on the screen, and so please fill that out. That's very important so that uh, we can uh, better know how to better serve you <clears throat> and know how effective uh, our workshops are. Amen. And then uh, we do we have some announcements. I know one announcement that I'd like to give, of course, is our next retreat. The retreat is coming up <clears throat> on the 27th of April, so uh, Saturday, a week from this coming Saturday, uh, at St. Mark Baptist Church at 9 o'clock a.m., 9 to 1. I'll take the first uh, hour, and we'll have a wonderful lunch in between. Uh, questions and answers, and then Pastor Pointer will take the second. I'll be teaching on preaching in a post-pandemic post -pandemic world, and Pastor Pointer will be teaching <clears throat> on leadership. And so we certainly want to encourage you to register, register now for uh, that workshop. Next year, next semester, hopefully we will have more time 
to spread these out a little bit. Uh, I was brought on a, a little later, and so we didn't have but March and April and some, uh, to, to work with. But we'll have more time next semester, Lord willing, to spread these out and uh, give you more time. But please, ma'am, please, sir, we want to uh, we want you to put to to register for our upcoming retreat, uh, thriving in ministry pastors retreat, uh, sponsored by Philander Smith University. Amen. And I certainly want to encourage you. We have a wonderful religion department uh, at Philander Smith. Uh, Dr. Graham Earl Graham is over it, and uh, if. Higher education is something interested that interests you. We certainly would hope that out of these workshops and retreats, uh, that someone one would be inspired to enroll uh, at Philander Smith University. Dr. Hudson, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Am I missing anything, Anita? Amen. Now, don't forget, we do have a grab-and-go dinner. We have grab-and-go dinners uh, for you, and uh, we certainly want you to take advantage of that and get something to eat and spend a little time fellowshipping with one another. If nothing else should hold our attention tonight, might we stand? Thank you again, Bishop. Thank you again, Grace United, for hosting us on tonight. Let's give Grace a hand. Let us pray. Lord, how we love and bless you and thank you and praise you for this opportunity that we've had tonight to share together. Thank you for Bishop Stephen Arnold and for Pastor Josh. Thank you for how you have brought these two wonderful congregations together. Uh, we continue to pray your blessings upon uh, this uh, unity, this, this relationship. We pray, Father, for other churches tonight, perhaps smaller churches that could benefit from uh, uniting their resources and members and buildings and and gifts and talents uh, to be a stronger congregation for you. We pray your continued blessings upon each and every minister of the gospel, pastor, their families today. Will you uh, bless as only you can? But not just the pastors, will you bless each and every one of us under the sound of my voice, those in person and those who are watching uh, by way of the internet. Might you meet every one of our needs, be our Jehovah Jireh, our God of provision. Now, Lord, we thank you for the food that has been provided for us, and we pray that it will be a blessing to us physically and spiritually. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Good evening.